Well, greetings again. Amen. We have one session, I think just about an hour long. And uh, we will go into lunch directly after that. Amen. Everyone say, this is the day, is the day. that the Lord has made. Lord has Let, us Let us rejoice and be glad in the day of the Lord. The of the Lord. Amen. Now, I want to just seamlessly continue from where we left off in the last session. In my first session in the school, or, or I think it was the second session, where I encouraged you to let the mind of your spirit lead the mind of your soul so that you can obey God in your body. Remember that? The mind of your spirit leading the mind of your soul so that you can obey God in your, in your body. Now that process is extremely important if you are going to fully receive the potential light that God wants to exhibit in and through your being. Okay? It's a very, very important process. In the book of Psalm 119, which is a psalm that extols the virtues of God's word, as you know. In verse 105, it says the following, Psalm 119 and verse 5. It says, Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So there are two luminaries, the lamp and the light, right? The lamp you hold, typically, if you hold a lamp, a lantern, or a lamp, if you hold it, and you're walking through darkness, it is to light up the step immediately in front of you. Not so? So you picture you're walking with a lamp, it's to, like, where to go next? The immediate short-term step. But also, it says the word is not just a lamp, the word is also a, a light that doesn't shine on the feet, the lamp illumines the feet. The light illumines the path. And the path alludes to something long term. So it's like a floodlight shining ahead of you. So you see the long term path. And then the lamp will direct the immediacy of what to do next in the path that is enlightened. Okay? Now, although you have an enlightened path, you still need the lamp to light the, the feet for the next immediate step. Okay? So this, amongst many things, is simply an allusion to the necessity for the daily encounter with the Word of God. You can know where you are going broadly, long-termly, in the long term, for the future. But you need to order your steps in the daily instructions that God gives to you so that you can walk the path determined for you. Okay? So long-term and short-term direction do come from God's word, which is, which is light. And I will encourage you to plan for short-term and long-term giving. There's, there, there's some giving that you simply respond spontaneously to. You know, as the Lord would cajole you and lead you. You almost have no time to think about it. It's just something God speaks to you and immediately you put plans to obey. And there are other times in which you look long term. Uh, uh, I want to encourage you here. Who would like to be a part of financing the next Apostolic School of Ministry? Come on, all the hands should be up here. Light should be shining. <laughs> right? All you do, and, and let me just say it to you, don't look at your Patmos. Don't look at your island and say that's a big thing. Right? If you function from light in the spirit, I would like you to start to think about your church or you as an individual, thinking about partnering with this noble initiative and say, I'm not coming next time as a delegate only. 
I want to finance what God is doing. Right? Barnabas saw the church birthed in Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 4, he sells a property and he puts the money at the apostles' feet. What do feet do? Thy word is a lamp to my feet. What do feet do? Everyone say move. Feet move. Right? Say progression. Barnabas' mind is this. I want to give momentum. I want to give movement to this new thing called the church that's just been birthed two, days, two chapters ago in Acts chapter in Acts chapter. Two. And do you know he was a Levite? Yeah? Acts chapter 4 tells us he's from, he was of Levi, right? He was, his, his heritage, his tradition was priesthood. Because from the tribe of Levi, the priesthood was drawn, right? Now please listen to this very carefully. When God said, give me your first fruits to Israel, God wanted first fruits from everything. It's from the produce of the land, the firstlings of animals, and even the firstborn from humans. Right? But God knew, and in the book I give you all the relevant scriptures, you can check this out. God knew that the giving of one's firstborn human son would be traumatic for a mother to part with her firstborn. There are some people in Scripture that obeyed it, like Hannah. She gave Samuel as a firstborn to Eli, the high priest, in the service of the temple. So God made allowance for the redemption of the firstborn by a particular mother or family where they had to make an offering of X amount to maintain the firstborn and not give the firstborn into the service of the reigning priesthood to help with the function of the temple service and priesthood functions, etc. God knew that it would be difficult for the maternal dynamic in mothers. It will be extremely heart-wrenching to give your firstborn son. And he made allowance for that to be withheld so long as there was a redemption um, price that was fulfilled. Right? Then God made this proviso. Then God said, okay, no problem. Keep your firstborn. But instead of every family giving me their firstborn, I will take the whole tribe of Levi as a firstborn unto me. Okay? And you'll, you'll see all the relevant scriptures in my writing. So God takes, watch this, a whole tribe as a firstborn representation unto himself. Right? Everyone say Levi becomes the embodiment of the first fruit principle. Now, the principle of first fruit is that the first fruit is representative of the rest. The first fruit represents the harvest. Not so? Right? The first fruit is a down payment that a harvest is coming. The fullness is coming. And if the first fruit is holy, what does Romans teach? The whole lump will be holy. Whatever quality the first fruit is, the rest will be. Okay? When you give your first fruits to God, you're literally saying everything belongs to you. Right? It's a portion, yes, but it's representation before God, like the tribe of Levi represented the other 12 tribes, technically. There are 13 tribes, technically, in Israel, right? Levi specifically not reckoned as such because God says, the Levites are mine. Every other tribe was awarded an allotment of land, physically and geographically, in Israel. You don't find a land called the land of the Levites, right? You'll find the land of Judah, the land of Dan, Bathsheba, all the other tribes, Except you won't find land apportioned to Levites. Because God said, I am their inheritance. They will not have an inheritance. When Joshua apportioned the land and distributed, divided territories, awarded them to each tribe, none went to Levi because God says, they are mine. I have chosen them for myself. When God sees the Levites, 
God sees the nation. The priesthood and the high priesthood were drawn from the Levitical tribe. Not so. Levites that qualified for priesthood, there were very stringent quali uh, 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 qualifications. Those were elected and, and grafted into the, into the priesthood. When all the rest of the 12 tribes paid tithes, the tithes, who received the tithes? The Levites received the, the tithes. And God says, this will be your portion forever. This is how the nations will honor you. A tithe of that collected tithe, a tithe of the tithe, a tenth of the tenth, was given to the high priest, right? And besides a tenth of the tenth given to the high priest, the first fruits collected um, were also directed directly to the reigning high priest within natural Israel. The point I want to stress, there's so many principles running through my mind now. Uh, the point I want to stress is the representative quality of Levi. Levi represents the whole, right? Everyone say he represents the whole, right? And I want to encourage you with this. When now in the New Testament you read that Barnabas was from this, this heritage, this is Barnabas' heritage, this is the culture, these are the principles that he knows to be true. Barnabas knows that God is my inheritance, so I don't need land. Who in their natural mind will sell all their land, take all the proceeds, and put it at the feet of the apostles? It's only a person full of light. It's only a person full of the depth of God that understands these principles. It does not make economic sense. Right? It does not make rational sense. But Barnabas knows exactly the principles governing the tribe from which he comes. He knows, you know what Levi means? What does Levi mean? Attached, connected to God. Not so? Huh? Moses was from the tribe of? Levi. Not so? You see, and Joshua was from the tribe of? Ephraim. To lead people out of Egypt and to lead them through a dry and barren wilderness desert conditions for 40 years, you need a leader that knows how to disconnect from the land and attach. Everyone say attach. And connect to the resource of God in heaven. Right? God did not choose a leader from any tribe to take them out of Egypt. He had to have someone from that heritage. Right? The Levitical principle had to be operative in the leadership of Moses. Joshua was from Ephraim. Ephraim means doubly fruitful, right? He was a man of conquest, uh, of, of war. Moses wasn't. Joshua was. So God uses, like a, like a good golfer. Who plays golf? Simon. Simon. <laughs> Simon's only golfer here. You know, by the way, I live opposite a wonderful golf course. Right? Frequented by many people in Durban. I lived there for 26 years now, and I haven't set my foot on the premises. <laughs> Maybe, Simon, you need to come and show me a few tricks. The game just doesn't appeal to me. Me, if I play sport, it must be finished within the hour. <laughs> it, does, it can't be slow. It must be, it must be intense. <laughs> But you know, from what I understand of golf, you use different clubs for different, I forget the technical language, but for, for different aspects of the play as you progress. Right? God, as he moves a nation out of his bag of sticks, takes different types of leaders to push the ball of his purposes closer and closer to the final hole. So he took the stick of Levi, Moses, you come and take them out. Right? Put the stick back. Take an Ephraimite, Joshua. You, you take them into conquest. When Joshua is finished, he pulls out the stick of Judah to complete the conquest of the land. In different epochs of time, different facets of, of leadership. Now what I want to encourage you with this, in terms of the Levitical priesthood, 
the anointing on Moses is to disconnect from land and attach to the heavens. A leader that knows how to enrich a people by staying fixated on the cloud in the heavens. Cloud by day in a pillar of fire by, by, by night. Barnabas was from this rich tradition. And he knows how to sell land and easily part with large volumes of money. And seemingly, everyone say seemingly. Seemingly disadvantage himself to advantage the kingdom. Inconvenience himself to convenience the, the kingdom. Because he functions from a position called light. Right? The light in him was extremely strong. Now, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my, and a light unto my path. In Psalm 18, verse 28, Psalm 18, verse 28, it says the following. You light my lamp. God illumines my darkness. You light my lamp. The Lord my God, what does He do? He illumines my darkness. What did we teach yesterday in Matthew 6? Um, it says the eye is the, the eye is the, Lamp of the body. And I said that's an allusion to your spirit, remember? Now to corroborate this, you will see this in Proverbs 20 and verse 27. It reads thus. Proverbs 20, 27 says, The spirit of man is what? The spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord. What? Searching all the innermost parts of his being. Remember we said no, no, no one understands the mind of a man but the spirit of the man, likewise, no one understands the depths in Father God except the spirit of God. So your spirit is extremely powerful. This is what I want to emphasize. Everyone say, my spirit is extremely powerful. It's so powerful, and I don't think we, we have yet to understand it. How can Paul say to Corinth, that man who slept with his father's wife? He says, I I." I'm not there, but I judge him. He says, I'm not there with you physically, but I'm there in spirit, and I judge him. How can Elisha say to Gehazi, where were you? You went to fraudulently extract funds from Naaman. Did not my, did not my spirit go with you? All these possibilities are not records in the Bible to make nice stories. I believe God is going to bring these facets now to the fore. And you're going to see a maturity in a man's spirit. Welcome to Mount Zion. To what? I'm quoting Hebrews 11. You have come to Mount Zion. To what? To the spirits of just men. What? Made perfect. Part of this perfection that Pastor Thama was speaking about includes perfection in your spirit it's not just righteousness as in your sins being forgiven i believe we have yet to explore the full possibilities of the spirit in of the spirit in man what i want what i do want to encourage you about is to give when you give anything financially the platform in you that you employ is your spirit which your spirit is full of grace full of light Full of depth, because his deep is calling unto that deep in you. And you will not count the cost. Also, the quality of your giving will hugely accentuate. It will increase reflexively. Right? You don't have it here, but in South Africa, when we park our cars, you have car attendants. The tradition is, when you park your car and when you leave, you tip the guy. You give him. Most people keep coins in the ashtray, so we never, oh, thank you, right? Whenever I go, I look for notes <laughs> to bless that person. I consistently, everyone say, train your mind. Train. I, if I can afford it, and even when I don't afford it, the Holy Ghost ministers to me, I consistently train my mind to give as much as possible, right? Everyone say, it's a culture. <laughs> so you're practicing generosity consistently, and you're doing this all the time. So, um, Proverbs 20 verse 27, the spirit 
of man is the lamp of the is the lamp of the Lord, searching out all his innermost being. Job 29 verse 3, Job said this. Job 29 verse 3. When his lamp, everyone say his lamp, right? Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. Say his word, his lamp. Say when, Job says when his lamp shone where? Shone over my head. Your biggest problem is between your ears. It's this brain. It's this head. It's this level of thinking. Now Job said when his lamp, his word, shone over my head, by his light, I walked through darkness. There is an authority in light. There is a spiritual authority. Let me just say this to you. Once you see a revelation, you are empowered to obey it. You will find yourself walking through a maze of deception, of concepts that kept you in bondage before. When the light hits you, it empowers you to, oh, to reflexively obey what the Lord said. Okay? When God said to Abraham, take your son, your only son, whom you love, and sacrifice the boy. I don't think he consulted Sarah. <laughs> That's what the Bible says. The next day, early in the morning, he arose. Sarah was fast asleep. You can't tell her mother, I'm about to obey God. Take this dear son of yours. <laughs> Go to a mountain, kill the boy. Don't worry, he will be raised from the dead. <laughs> You think, you see, Sarah represents the maternal soul dynamic that feels, that is governed by emotive love rather than by agape love, right? By the way, after he came back down the mountain, he never went back to Hebron where Sarah was. Which husband's going to go face a wife? And say, guess what just happened? <laughs> I've seen some movies depicting this where the movie makers immediately after that event depict an argument between Sarah and, and uh, Abraham. You know, there's, there's aspects in God that you need to obey without consulting reason. You need to obey without consulting the paternal dimension that wants to withhold the baby. When God says, give the baby, offer the child, right? And I want to encourage you, when he speaks, obey reflexively. Because it says very clearly here, when his, when his light, his lamp, shone over my reasoning, right? Some of us got too much reasoning. Our heads get in the way of our obedience. And some of us have big heads, <laughs> No, I'm using that euphemistically, uh, allegorically. I'm using it symbolically, right? Some of the biggest hindrance is our thought patterns, and we need to subject that. You see, when light comes, it will override the darkness, potential darkness that is present in and within your being. Now go to Matthew chapter 6. Let's end with this in terms of this theme. Let's end with this verse. This I quoted to you, uh, I think, on the first session, right? Matthew 6 and verse 19. It says then, do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. For, but store yourselves up treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And then he suddenly says, the eye is the lamp of the the body and from proverbs we know that the spirit is the lamp right and when his lamp shines over your soul which is your head right your spirit that's why the mind of your spirit your lamp must shine over the mind of your soul this head this thinking then you can walk through darkness right it says when the eye is the lamp of the body so then if your eye is clear up loose Simple, without fault, without disease, right? Your whole body will be full of light. I say this prophetically, my whole body, come on, say it, my whole body 
is full of light. It's all based on the quality of light in your spirit. Right? You know, there are some people, you just look at them, you see darkness. I'm not talking about skin color. Because <laughs> then the whole of Africa is in trouble. I am talking about the quality of the character in the man. And the state of integrity of his spirit. It's like this thing shines through. And it's easily detectable. It's easily perceptible to him who is discerning. Not so? But he says... If your eye is bad, poneros, evil, manifest, like I said, by a stingy, non-generous disposition, your whole body is full of darkness, and if the light in you, if the, if the light in you is darkness, how great is that? Darkness. No man can serve two masters. He starts talking about money immediately. After talking about light in the eyes, he starts addressing issues of who is your master, right? No man can serve two masters. He will hate the one, love the other, and be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and mammon. You cannot serve both God and mammon. Now, why does Jesus, talking about money in the middle, talks about money first, treasure uh, in heaven where moth and rust do not decay. And then at the end of the discussion, talk about money. No man can serve God and mammon. And sandwiched between these two issues, he slots in this. Your eyes must be full of light. Right? And if the, your eye, your spirit, everyone say your spirit. Yes. Clear, undiseased. And like I explained, generous. Because God, your father, who is spirit, is a generous giver. Then he says your whole body. In other words, everything that you touch will be full of light, right? Now, in the matter of first fruits, when Israel moved away from an agrarian economy to a more vocationally based economy, when they were farmers, when they were agriculturalists, it was easy to determine first fruits. You just, whatever came first, you harvested that and you gave it to the high priest. In Jesus' day, under rabbinical teaching, they would ask rabbis what should be our first fruits. We're not farmers anymore. We, most of us are working vocationally. How do we determine our first fruits? So they, the rabbis did an estimate historically, and their conclusion was this, that based upon what farmers did historically in the nation, you could give anywhere from between one fortieth and one sixtieth of the total potential harvest of a field. Everyone say one fortieth to one sixtieth. Right? One fortieth to one sixtieth. And so they would suggest to people simply give anywhere from between one fortieth to one sixtieth of your total annual salary. If you're working for a boss and he's paying you in the year over a, a calendar year, give between one. 40th and 1, 60th. Now we suggest to people today, if you're starting off in the practice of first fruits, give 1 over 52. The first week of, one, the first week's income in a 52 week calendar year. It equates on average very much to what the early rabbis taught. Okay? And in the book I, I reference Greek and Hebrew words that literally suggest a, a 2% or just under 2% of gross annual earnings, okay? Which would equate to the first week's income in a calendar year in that specific category once off, right? Once off in the month, the first month of the year. But the rabbis also said this, and I want to read it to you. This is from the writings of Hillel. Hillel was the great, one of the greatest teachers in rabbinical tradition and he had a school the school of Hillel right and he said this let me I wrote, I wrote this in my book Hillel was in charge of the biggest rabbinical school in Israel said if a person honors teruma teruma is one of the words for 
first fruits. He said this, if a person honors teruma at 140th, at the 140th level, his eye is said to be full of light. If he honors teruma at 150th, his eye is said to be a middling eye. You're in the middle. Middling eye. If he honors teruma at 160th level, that person has an evil eye. This is what this great scholar taught. Now, that was the teaching in Jesus' day, right? Now you can understand Jesus knows what is out there. And Jesus makes this statement. If he talks about finances, and he makes a statement, if your eye is clear, right? Your body will be full of light. But if your eye is dark, and you've got this withholding, stingy spirit, your, the light in you is actually darkness. And how great is that? Darkness. The Jews listening to him knew exactly what he was hitting at. Jesus in this passage was actually teaching about first fruits. Because he was addressing a body of knowledge that was very common in his day. And his listeners would have pitched into it. Obviously, which is the greater, 140th or 160th? Right? For those of you who did your maths, 140th is greater than 160th. Right? And Hillel says, whoever gives first fruits at one, the 140th level, his eye is full of light. Right? If you give at the 150th level, you have a middling eye. Right? But if you give at the 160th level, you have an evil eye, you're full of darkness. He is saying, the more you give, the quantity of what you give testifies to how much light is in you. Right? It alludes to how much light is in you. Now ask your neighbor, so, come on, talk to your neighbor. <laughs> Say, neighbor, so how's your light content? <laughs> you know how we will know? When it's giving time and you withhold. How great is the darkness in you? <laughs> but generosity gives tacit evidence of a spirit full. Everyone say full of light. A spirit completely illumined by the light of God. Now, I don't want to put anybody under condemnation. Please listen to me. Tell your neighbor, start where you are. Just start where you are. Right? Just start where you are and say, God, today's my day of change. Right? Uh, I'm going to track. I, I do annual assessment of my financial giving. I do it annually. I have to do it because I have to present to our tax, SARS is the South African Revenue Service. Any income I get in my, in, my, in my bank account or process through my hands, I keep a diligent record of it. My wife does more of this than I do. And we keep both digital files and hard copies. And you know what I've noticed over the years? God is blessing me more and more. Right? God is blessing me more and more. No one comes to a place of great prosperity overnight. Prosperity and financial breakthrough is not an event. It is a process of consistent obedience. Right? Some of us, you want to pray some 18 cent prosperity now. Right? But you forget the light issue. And the light issue is the degree to which you are generous and consistent within your giving. And I've noticed when we do our annual financial assessments, I'll, I'll, I will, I bind it actually in a ring binder thing like this. Besides the files on my, con on my computer, I have them filed in my wardrobe. And we take them out from 10 years ago, lay them on the bed. And you know what sometimes I do? I lift up my hand and say, see what the Lord has done. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. And you know what? If you are, that is why you can understand scriptures like this. If you are unfaithful with unrighteous mammon, right? how can God entrust to you True riches. Everyone say there's riches 
and there's true riches. Right? If you can't, if, if God cannot trust you with His money, <laughs> how can He then entrust you with eternal truth, with eternal riches? Do you know, Pastor Thomas taught me the secret. It was, everyone say secrets. Now when I engage spiritual father, I want, I want the secret. I want, give me the secret why you got where you got. Right? One of the secrets, and James can attest to us, attest to this, Pastor Thomas said to us that one of the biggest keys to him accessing revelation and truth is generous giving. There is a relationship between how a man gives financially and the truth he accesses spiritually. If you can't be faithful with natural money, God cannot entrust to you stewardship over eternal truths. One of the quickest ways to access greater revelation is to prove yourself faithful with financial giving. Okay? It's one of the easiest ways and one of the the, 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 the quickest ways. If therefore you have been faithful in the use of unrighteous mammon or unrighteous wealth, who will entrust the true riches to? Who will entrust the true riches to you? Barnabas proved faithful in giving, and God commissioned him as an apostle. Right? God commissioned him as an apostle to prove faithful with the management of spiritual riches. Now we have grown to the place. You may ask me, where am I in my journey? Right? My father in the Lord gives seven months' salary away. In any one year, seven months are given away. Right? Now, you might be intimidated by that. I say, God, Mike, there's no hope for me. No, no, there is hope for you. <laughs> I'll be open here. I'm only on one month at the moment. Right? The Lord has tested me. I went from one week, the one year, a few years, then I went to two weeks. The one year I went, I gave, I gave three weeks away. Everyone say, as your faith grows. It says, by faith, Abel offered first fruits. Right? So if you can kill the fear, kill the doubt. And the way you do this is by, everyone say, repetition. Just keep doing it and God will, God will give you more faith and more light. And you start to give more and, and more. Okay? The reason why I'm challenging you about this it's not about more money that we want. We want to steward greater riches. That's the eye. That's where our eye is on. Right? We want to steward greater riches that God wants to offload to the body of Christ in the day in which we live. Come on, everyone say, just trust God. Come on, say it again. Trust God. Right? Now, you have to trust the Lord. Now, in Proverbs chapter 3, let's look at it very quickly. Very, very quickly. In Proverbs chapter 3. You know, Proverbs chapter 3 is the most well often quoted verse in reference to giving. Right? 3 verse 9 and 10. Okay? Proverbs 3 verse 9 and 10. Now, you cannot understand verse 9 and 10 if you don't understand from verse 1 to verse 8. It is always wise to read a verse in its context, you get the flow of thought. Before you come to this conclusion, you're going to have to read through the commentary of what the Lord is saying. So let's read from verse 1. Look at verse 1. Everyone say, my son. My son. So who's speaking? A father is addressing a son. Oh, wisdom is speaking here, but it's really a father that is speaking. My son, do not forget my teaching right my son do not forget my teaching but let your heart keep my commandments for length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you do not let kindness and truth leave you bind them around your neck write them on the the tablet of your heart so you will find, everyone say grace. The word favor here is grace. So you will find grace and a good repute in the eyes of the Lord. Now, everyone say trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. 
With some of your heart? It's with all of your heart. And do not lean upon your own understanding. Not this head of yours. Right? Your cognitive, unrenewed soul. Natural thinking. Don't abandon it. The command is just don't lean on it. Right? Don't rely. Everyone say don't rely. So there's a thinking that you mustn't depend upon. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In some of your ways, acknowledge Him. No, it doesn't say that. It says in all of your, in all of your ways, acknowledge Him. And He will make your paths straight. If it's crooked, it will become straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. I sometimes argue with people that fight the first fruit teaching, and I can see clearly this is wisdom in your own eyes. Right? There's the wisdom that comes from above, that is pure, peaceable, easy to be entreated. Everyone say, fear the Lord. Yeah. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It will be healing to your body and refreshment to your bones. Now, honor the Lord from your wealth, and from the first of your produce. Verse 10, your bonds will be filled with plenty, especially if your surname is Barnwell. Okay, <laughs> that's not in there. I'm just reading into the text. Sometimes my meditation goes off. <laughs> okay, <laughs> right? So your bonds will be filled with plenty, and your vats will overflow with new wine. Now read verse 1 again. What does this one start with? My son, do not forget my teaching. And yesterday, what did I say to you? When is God forgotten? When is God forgotten according to Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 18 or 18, 11? God is forgotten when his principles are no longer adhered to, remember? Right? God is forgotten. So the, how does it start? Do not forget my word. In other words, do not disobey. And then in verse 5, what does it say? Trust in the Lord, all your heart. And in verse 6, in all your ways. Again, do not be wise in your own eyes. And in verse 9, honor the Lord with your first fruits. You see, the bedrock, that drives first fruits practice, in my mind, when I studied the text, are two things. The one is honor, and the one is trust. Right? You cannot understand Proverbs 3 verse 9 without fully embracing Proverbs 3 verse 5. Right? If you fulfill verse 5, you can obey verse 9. Verse 5 says to trust. When you give first fruits, and usually when you give first fruits, you have nothing left. It's all you have. You are saying, God, I don't trust my economy. My trust is in the Lord. Okay? The failure to obey first fruit practice is a, is a problem of distrust. You're not trusting God enough. You know? You're not trusting God sufficiently enough enough and I want to encourage you you will be tested by the Lord like Abraham was tested to give up your Isaac to give up your first fruits because there's a powerful interplay of one who trusts in the Lord by the offer of a first fruit with the way in which God accelerates his his, his prophetic purpose for that for that purpose for that person it just happens spontaneously it happens all the time. Right? You cannot father nations if you cannot give up your only son. That prophetic purpose is going to be built upon the strength of your obedience of giving up the, the, the first fruits offering to the Lord. You see this in the life of Barnabas. You see this in the life of um, many personalities in the scripture. But you'll see the opposite also where people disobeyed, how they retrogressed, right? Judas is a non-feature in terms of 
stewarding purposes because of his greed and because of his gluttony. Ananias and Sapphira die in the midst of a great move of God because of the way in which they handled finances. Achan took the first fruits and he used it and he stored it in his own tent. Why do I say first fruits? Jericho was God's first fruits. Not so. God said to Israel, take the first city. Everyone say the first city. Take the first city, but don't touch any of its spoil. Everything there belongs to me. Right? And what did Achan do? Achan took some items, a Babylonian garment, some silver and some gold, and he hid it in the ground in his tent. Everyone say, in the ground, in his tent. Right? And what did that have the effect of doing? Right? It had the effect of hampering the further dynamics of purpose. Say purpose. Let me just say this. I really want to speak seriously about this issue. If you are serious and want to accelerate the rate at which other aspects of God's purposes come to pass in your life, God's going to test you significantly about putting Him first financially in your life. First fruits opens the floodgates of blessings of other aspects of God's purpose in your life to start to come to pass. Achan messed up and they attacked Israel after taking Jericho. Oh, by the way, what does Jericho mean? Jericho means sent. Jericho has four or five meanings, among which are, everyone say sent. Say apostolic. Say first. He said some first apostles. Everything about Jericho represents the first. Say fragrance. Jericho also means fragrance. It also means let him smell it. Everyone say let him smell it. I think I told you this. Wherever I travel in the world, wherever, and I come home, like I'm going home tomorrow, guess what my wife cooks? She cooks rice and a pot of hot mutton curry. When I come, I can smell that thing from the car park. <laughs> that thing hits me. But she knows it's my favorite. And let me just for the record say this. I'm glad this is publicized everywhere in the world. There is no person on earth that makes a mutton curry like my wife. I'll taste and curry worldwide. That curry does something to me. It fires me up. Okay. And when I come home, which I know is going to happen tomorrow, I can smell that mutton from the car park. If I stay in the car park, I will not eat the fullness of the meal, although I can smell it. Jericho means let him smell it. God is saying to Israel, don't touch Jericho. Jericho is simply a smell of what awaits you in the conquest of the entirety of the, of the land. Don't touch the first. It's simply a fragrance. It's going to activate the scent dynamic because Jericho means scent. Everyone said it activates the scent dynamic. It's going to activate the apostolic dynamic within your midst. Achan, unfortunately, greed, covetousness, got a hold of him, and he took the first fruits for himself. Please remember this. The first fruits is holy. Do you know what? I read a bit of Hillel's reading because of my interest in first fruits. Do you know what Hillel says once about the first fruits? He said, whatever you do, do not eat your first fruits. It was very strong. Whatever you do, do not eat your first fruits. And he, he actually said, if you don't have a man of God worthy of it, rather give it to the poor. But you don't touch it. Right? But you have a man of God worthy. Come on, say this, I have a man of God worthy. Right? Just put Nehemiah 12.44 quickly. Nehemiah 12.44. Do you know in Nehemiah's day, God raised him up as a reformer, and he brought the nation back to threefold giving. First fruits, tithes, and, and offerings. On that day, 
the men were also appointed over the chambers for the stores. Now, you only build storages when there's abundance, not so. Remember we read in Hezekiah's day, there were heaps collected in the third month, went to the seventh month, right? Every major reformer like Hezekiah, Malachi, yeah, we get Nehemiah that called the nation back to threefold giving. There was this profuse abundance. So he had the necessity to instigate the building of storage chambers. Chambers for the stores, for what? For the contributions. There'll be a great day we have to build stuff to, <laughs> to store people's giving because it's too profuse. Right? The, everyone say the first roots. Say the tithes. To gather into them from the fields of the cities of the portions required by the law for the priests and for the Levites. Now the word for you must be read like this. Because. Say because. Why was, there, why was the abundance? This is the reason that Nehemiah offers. Nehemiah says for Judah. Everyone say Judah. Judah rejoiced over the priests and the Levites who served. Right? If you don't rejoice over your priest who serves you, I celebrate my father. And I'm sure I speak for all of the sons here. We have a good man of God that God has given to us. It's a rarity. Everyone say a rarity. You don't find this under every stone. And when you find a precious pearl, when you find a pearl of great price, you sell all you have to get the pearl. Not so, the parable. In the imagery of the city of the living God in the book of Revelation chapter 21, the church is as a city. In that, the church is four square, not so? Three gates on each side, making 12 gates. Then the writer says, each gate, there was an angel at each gate. And what are angels? Fathers. Everyone say messengers. Right? They are, the, the gates, are, the doors are a symbol of leadership, of fatherly leadership. Spiritual fathers will act as emissaries or angels. Right? And the gates were attached to the walls. The walls are a representation of the apostolic I'm just summarizing a whole body of teaching here, right? The walls are the apostolic. And then it says, and each gate was like a pearl. Yeah. And then when you read that, you think gates, like you mean wall, gate. Then John says, and each gate was like a pearl. Not so? So don't cast your pearl before swine. Your spiritual father, who is a gate, an angel that gives you access to the road of gold. John says, if you open the gate and the street, everyone say street. street. There are no streets of gold in the Bible. I don't know where we got that from. Nowhere. Bet me, put some money down. Nowhere. In the whole Bible is there reference to streets of gold. That's concocted. That's not the design of God. There's only a reference. Everyone say one street. One street. Say the street. the street. Right? Look at that. Put that reference up. I see you had it up there. Revelation. Twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each one of the gates was a single pearl. And the street of the city was like pure gold. Say one street. Who is the way? Jesus. What does gold depict? Divinity. If you open the door, your father who is the pearl should lead you into the nature of Christ. That is what is meant here. There is no reference in the Bible to streets of gold in heaven. Not one. Right? We've misinterpreted the scriptures. Tell your neighbor, get back to the Bible. Right? Let me get back to what I'm saying here. Listen carefully. Each gate, each gate was a pearl. Not so? 
right? Each gate was a pearl. And you know, amongst the many imageries of pearl, a pearl denotes wisdom, right? Like words, his words were like pearls of wisdom, we say in English, right? Now, you must honor, everyone say honor. honor. You must be able to say, blessed is he who comes in the, in the name of the Lord for you to also say, send prosperity now. You can't say send prosperity now without also saying blessed is he who comes in the, in the name of the, in the name of the Lord. And I want to encourage us all. Jesus said, don't cast your pearl before, before swine. And in another parable he says, the kingdom of God is like a man, a merchant. And when he finds a pearl of immeasurable value. Everyone say immeasurable value. Right? Inestimable, costly. He sells all his hair he has to secure the pearl. And in another place he says to buy the whole field in which the pearl is located. Right? Now, how many of you love your pearl? I'm not talking about these pearls that you're hanging around your neck. I'm talking about the man or woman of, that God sent to you as the gate to lead you into the street of gold called Christ, right? You see, fathers are not an end in themselves. They're an access, everyone say access point. Say entry point to the divinity of God, right? Any door you access in the book of Revelation, any of the 12, comes to the same location. We all enter the revelation of the knowledge of, of Christ, Okay? Now, Nehemiah 12 verse 44 says, there was this abundance of first fruits. Why? Repeat this last statement for Judah with me. One, two, three. For Judah rejoiced over the priests and the Levites who served. You see, if you cannot celebrate your pearl, if there's not an overwhelming comprehension of what they represent in your life, you will sometimes wane in your expressions of honor. Everyone say honor. honor. Because honor drives the first fruit principle. The bedrock is honor the Lord with your wealth and the first fruits of all your, of all your increase. I cannot wait. I literally get impatient to honor and to, to, to administrate my first fruits. It's a joy. There's an eagerness. There's a celebration in my heart. I rejoice over the priest that God has sent me. And in this there is great blessing. What did God say to Samuel in the book, or to Eli in the book of 1 Samuel? Them that honor me, I will honor them. The honor that God gives is reciprocal to the honor that is demonstrated before, before him. But you're going to have to be a person full of light, clothed in light. There's another verse that speaks about being clothed in the light of God. Living in a time zone called the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord. Okay? Now, I want to challenge us all. Everything flows from you as a, as a leader. Whenever I honor my father in the Lord with first fruits, I tell my church what I did and what I gave. Because I want to set an example before them that everything we expect from them to do from God's word, we ourselves are leading the way in doing it. And people catch the impartation from your example. Right? They catch the impartation from your example. And you can confer a blessing upon your entire household. Are you aware of the scripture? I think it's in Hebrews 7, where it says that Levi was in the loins of Abraham when Abraham gave tithes to Melchizedek. Right? Levi was in the loins of Abraham when he paid tithes to or gave tithes to Melchizedek. Levi wasn't born when Abraham 
was giving tithes to Melchizedek. Levi will come many years down the line. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob has 12 sons. Levi is one of those sons. Yet the Bible says now, Levi is going to come hundreds of years down the line, but Abraham is giving tithes to Melchizedek, and the writer of the book of Hebrews, phenomenal person, by the leading of the Lord says, Levi is right there. He's in Abraham's loins, futuristically but now present. So when Abraham gave tithes, Levi gave tithes. Because Abraham did it representatively of someone in his loins. Every leader, everyone say every leader. Every. When you obey God, especially in the matter of giving, you do so representatively of everyone in your loins. You do so to configure generations that are still coming after you. Right? My children, both my, my two eldest boys, when they started work, brought their salaries their first months to me. And you, my father, the Lord, and they, they gave it to my wife and I. So we were feeling a bit awkward. Not that we should, but I mean, you know, we know how much they needed the money. And we said, so we were glad they did it. And what we realized, they did it because of impartation, not via instruction. We didn't tell them. They just did it reflexively. Because when a father obeys God, everyone in his loins are going to obey him after him. You always give repre Sensitively. In my book, I won't have time to teach it, but I speak to leaders and I say this. You give representatively of those which are in your loins that are still yet to be born. i got to be faithful now because of my great, great, great grandson. Still coming. Right? He is in my loins. But there are those presently in my heart. And Paul says, I think to the Philippians, I have you where? In my heart. Every leader has people both in his heart and in his loins. People in his life presently that he's representing. And people in his loins futuristically that are still to come. Not so? Right? And so it's very important that you understand this. Pastor Thamo taught us, um, that when a leader obeys, like for example, the first fruit principle, that he does so representatively on behalf of his whole house. Everyone in his heart. Remember Aaron the high priest wore a, uh, what, a breastplate, was it? And a different colored gemstones. Each one represented all the tribes of Israel. So when he stood before God, God didn't see him. God saw the whole nation. One man can represent a whole nation. If he holds them where? Near his chest, in his heart. Paul says to the Philippians, I have you in my, I have you in my heart. And might I, I really want to encourage us. I believe it's possible that if you obey God, God will confer the blessing of your obedience upon your whole house. Even those who are disobedient in your house, what I've noticed, due to my consistency over time, I've seen the most rebellious people start to comply. Because that grace of obedience, everyone say the grace to obey. The grace to obey, listen to me very carefully, grows authoritatively in the leader. And you configure the character of your house by your singular acts of obedience. It doesn't exclude anybody. And people will still suffer consequences if they rebellious and willingly disobey. But there's a measure of immunity, I believe, that is conferred upon the entirety of the group. But you've got to celebrate the pearl that God has given to you. Everyone say, trust in the Lord. Trust Come on, say it again. Trust in the Lord. Trust now, it's very important. We've got just four minutes and then we'll conclude. Proverbs 16 and verse 20. Proverbs 16 and verse 20 says the following. I am trying to build your trust and your faith. I'm trying to encourage you. Don't, 
don't be a clever fool. You've got clever fools. Eh? They are brainless in the spirit. Jesus said to the two walking to the road of Emmaus, Oh, you fools, slow of heart to believe. All that the prophets have said. The Greek word is bradus, slow of heart. Bradus, B-R-A-D-U-S. You, you, you take such a long time to come to obedience and revelation. Now, a fool is one without a spiritual brain. Right? Everyone say, just trust in the Lord. If I were you, I'll forget all the technicalities of these messages. If I were you, I would say, talk to my wife, my spouse. Honey, let's just close our eyes and let's just trust God. Let's just trust Him. And He's not unfaithful to stand by His word. He is very faithful. He will come through for you. Right? Proverbs, what did I say? 16 and verse 20. Proverbs 16 and verse 20. He who gives attention to the word will find good. And blessed is he who trusts in the Lord. Now, you might say to me, Randolph, I trust God. Right? I will simply ask you one question on this verse. So, do you give attention to the word? You see, trust can be a nebulous thing. It is not an abstract thing. Your trust in God is measured by the attention that you give to God's word. And that attention must be expressed by acts of obedience. Now, Hezekiah's reformation is a classic reformation when it comes to God restoring financial order to Israel. Right? And yesterday we read how that they gathered in heaps, remember? when the, the, the act of giving first fruits, tithes, and offerings were restored. There's a very important verse in that text that unlocks some of the keys. I'll just reference one. Second Kings 18 and verse 5 and 6. You, you'll find these accounts in the book of Chronicles and in Kings. So yesterday we read the Chronicles version. In Second Kings, here is Hezekiah. Everyone say, he trusted he trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel, so that after him there was none like him among the kings of Judah, nor among those who were before him. Just stop there. Everyone say he trusted in the Lord. Now how can a man's trust be so strong that in God's mind no king of Judah compares to him? when it comes to the matter that this leader trusts in me. Right? And in the next verse, it gives the reason. Everyone say he clung to the Lord. He, right? he, he was a cleaving. He clung to the Lord and he did not depart from following him, but he kept his commandments which the Lord had commanded Moses. He kept the commandments which the Lord had commanded commanded Moses. I want you to make a commitment. Our time is gone. I want you to make a commitment. We'll continue this after lunch. I want you to make a commitment today and to renew your trust in God. You're saying, God, no matter what happens to me, I will cling to you. No matter what happens to me, I'm not going to sacrifice principles for personal comfort. I'm going to trust you. I'm not going to lean upon my own understanding. When the pressure is on, sometimes we relax principles to ensure personal comfort. I want, to, I want us to make a commitment to God today. I trust you. I trust you, God. Because without Proverbs 3 verse 5, Proverbs 3 verse 9 is not going to happen. Unless you trust in the Lord with all your heart, then you can honor the Lord with the first fruits of your, of your increase. And as your trust grows, so will your consistency in the quantity and quantum of your giving grow commensurately with that trust. Do you know the three Hebrew boys refused to bow to the statue of King Nebuchadnezzar? And you know what their, their view is? 
You know what they said? O king. I like the way they start. <laughs> Let it be known to you today. <laughs> you know, they're very confident, bold. Let it be known to you that our God will deliver us. But even if he doesn't deliver us, we still knock on the bar. You know, that's like we are so holding fast to principle. We're so convinced God will deliver us. But even if he doesn't deliver us, we're not going to sacrifice the principle. Okay? This is a place of indomitable, not leaning on my own understanding. A place of absolute trust and loyalty and commitment to the Lord God of Israel. And God is very faithful. He will take good care of you. Amen. God bless you.